right, let's get started. Good afternoon and welcome everyone to the Parish Art Museum. My name is Corinne Ernie. I'm the Deputy Director of Curatorial Affairs here at the Parish. And it gives me, it gives me great pleasure to celebrate the 10th anniversary of this beautiful building that you find yourself in today. And with none less than the architects from Herzog and de Meuron who actually designed this building. So when I started talking to Askan Mergenthaler and Phil Schmerbeck about this conversation and who they wanted to talk with, they said um, against expectations, like I thought maybe an architecture critic, but no, they said, we want to talk to an artist, <coughs> excuse me, who is currently showing at the parish. And I could think of none better than the artist Hank Willis Thomas, with whom, yes, please, applause. <laughs> with whom I have actually just organized an exhibition, uh, which is up right now. It's called Another Justice, Us is Them. So you're welcome to visit the exhibition after the talk. And Hank organized, we organized this with Hank and the um, artist collective called For Freedoms that he co-founded in 2016 to encourage civic participation. And so Hank is someone who doesn't only think about how to hang the work, but he's thinking about the space about the institution and the community that he's uh, entering in dialogue with when he does an exhibition. So, um, and the conversation will be moderated by our executive director, Monica Ramirez Montagud, and I will give you a little introduction to our speakers today. So, Askan Mergenthaler is senior partner, partner at Herzog & de Meuron in charge of projects in Europe, Asia, and the Americas. He has led the realization of the De Young Museum in San Francisco, the Tate Modern Project in London, the Elb Philharmonie in Hamburg, and M Plus, a cultural center for 20th and 21st century art, design, architecture, and the moving image in Hong Kong. He is currently working on the Neue Nationalgalerie Museum des 20. 20. Jahrhunderts in Berlin, and the Triangle in Paris, the first high rise since the Tour Montparnasse. He studied at Stuttgart University and the Bartlett University College London, and he joined Herzog and Dermeron in 1998. Philip Schmerbeck is Studio Director USA at Herzog and Dermeron. He oversees a diverse range of projects in the US, including 215 Christie, which is a public hotel, 160 Leroy Street, and the Powerhouse Arts Project, a contemporary arts fabrication center nearing completion in Brooklyn as well as the Brooks Museum of Art in Memphis, Tennessee. He studied architecture at Mississippi State University and he joined the company in 2007. Hank Willis Thomas, he's an artist uh, working with themes related to identity, commodity, media, and popular culture. His work has been exhibited worldwide, including the International Center of Photography, the Brooklyn Museum, PS1 Contemporary Art Center, the Studio Museum in Harlem, and we're very fortunate to have its executive director here, Thelma Golden, thank you. Um, the Guggenheim Museum, Bilbao, Spain, the Musée de Quai Branly in Paris, Hong Kong Art Center, Zeitz Museum, and the list goes on and on. Um, his work is also in numerous public collections, including MoMA, the Guggenheim Museum, and the Whitney. And he has been commissioned to create works, many works in public space, most recently to do a memorial to Martin Luther King and Coretta Scott King, which will be unveiled on Boston Common on MLK Day next year. So um, last but not least, um, before joining the parish as executive director this July, Monica Ramirez Montagud was director at the Michigan State University Eli and Edith Broad Art Museum, where she organized Frida Kahlo Without Borders, which is coming here in the fall, and Saha Hadid Design All Told. Prior, she served as the director of the Newcomb Art Museum of Tulane University in Louisiana, where she organized Per Sister Incarcerated Women of America and exhibitions with McLean Thomas and Koss. She has held curatorial positions at the San Jose Museum of Art in California, the Aldrich Contemporary Art Museum in Richfield, Connecticut, and the Guggenheim Museum. Monica earned a PhD in theory and history of architecture from the Universitat Politecnica de Catalunya in Barcelona, Spain. 
And she was recently appointed by President Biden to the National Museum and Library Services Board, the advisory panel to the Institute of Museum and Library Services. So please welcome our panelists. Thank you. Thank you, Corinne. Can you hear me? Okay. <laughs> thank you, Corinne. Um, thank you, everyone, for being here. I wish you were all sitting here to also enjoy the beautiful view that we have here, but it includes you all. So thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Monica Ramirez, and I wanted to get us started with a conversation. And um, I've identified about th four themes that I think overlap between the practice of Hank Willis Thomas and, and the approach to design and architecture. Um, uh, from the Herzog de Mouron uh, firm. And so, but the, the first obvious question that I wanted to ask, and I'm gonna ask Hank if you could answer first, uh, if you don't mind, uh, was, you know, is it, is it different? And is it, I, personally, I think we're in an incredibly architecturally relevant building, like few in the world. So thank you so much. I, we enjoy this architecture, we think it's relevant, and we think, that folks that come to the parish have access to excellence just by opening the door and, uh, and then walking through our galleries and also having access to excellent art, excellent architecture, excellent design. I do think that architecturally relevant buildings add layers of meaning and symbolism and texture and richness to the visitor experience. But I wanted to hear from, from the perspective of an artist, you know, does it make a difference to show in an architecturally relevant building? Does it make you see your work differently? Do you plan the exhibition differently? Um, is it a challenge? In some buildings I gather, it might be more challenge than others. Or is it a, is it a privilege? Like how, how does that um, play out when you're an artist? Sure. Well, I think it's all of the above. <laughs> it's a challenge and a privilege and there are all kinds of uh, complexities. I have to say, this is one of those museums, one of these buildings that you enter, you don't forget. So I mentioned that I first came here a decade ago, not knowing that I would be able to show my work here. And so it's really an honor to do that. I, I met you like, what, 16, 17 years ago. Um, and it's in, been an amazing journey, really, as a son of a curator, my mother, Deborah Willis, who always, throughout my childhood, saw spaces where artists were finding new ways to present their work. Uh, and only a, in the past, I think, 15 years have I really seen as many museums that look like they are works of art <laughs> in themselves. <laughs> that kind of changes the way that I think about what to do in the space. And the artists that we collaborated with in this exhibition were all very honoring and enthusiastic about showing, but also somewhat kind of, if not intimidated, challenged by like what is the best way that I can present my work in the space because it does say so much already <laughs> and, and uh, I can just say for myself that the work that is here of mine um, it means a lot to present it here especially the the neon remember me on the outside because I think it's become an iconic landmark that this building has but also the text work that's been installed over the past a few years is really a welcoming to the region. Uh, and then this is also uh, a time in our country and a place where a lot of the complexities that we um, are dealing with both seem far away and also extremely present. And, and so to, to be able to talk about um, a lot of the things that I think we're, are going on in the world but that are also relevant to, to what's happening here in this space is, is really very, very exciting. So thank, thank you, you Hank. And so the, the question um, um, goes to the architects. What, what, was, um, what was the definition of art in your minds? Like, you were, were you defi defining spaces for the exhibition of art? Were you, what was that relationship for you? And, or were you, define, you know, designing for the visitor experience? What, you know, how did you define this relationship between art and architecture to then design a building for it? I mean, we have a long-standing... Do you hear me? No. Uh, we have a long-standing relationship with artists and we always listen very closely to artists and we want to understand 
what is perfect for them. So I mean, basically our buildings are there to serve the artists in the art in the best possible way. And I think that um, worked in this example um, quite well. We have been um, in dialogue and discussions with uh, the artist community of Long Island at that time when we started designing the project. And we met them in New York and out here and we visited them in their studios and we were basically listening to them. What do you like about this place and how would you think you would like your art to be shown in this place? And it's a special place, you know, it's a very um, unique place and it's not so clear that um, you're able to build a museum in a, in a, in a setting that since many, many, many decades um, is populated and loved by artists. And we asked them the question, what do you really like about this place? And um, it was always the same answer, it was always about the light, the daylight, the light. And uh, that's why we were so happy that um, with the team, the design team at the very first parish art museum we designed, uh, you know, might know that there are um, two versions of it, <laughs> a luxury version and, uh, and the um, <laughs> trimmed down version, which is probably may maybe even the more powerful one, um, but both um, uh, basically the idea was that the artist studio is, is the nucleus, the inspiring DNA, and that daylight um, would play an important role. And this is not so um, evident. You know, nowadays we work on many museums, you just heard the list um, worldwide, and it's typically the other way around. It's always that the curators and conservators tell us that the daylight should not be in the galleries and they want to cut it out and want to control it all with artificial light. So for us, it was great that all the people we have dealt with here um, during the design process, first and second um, concept, supported this idea and um, encouraged us to continue with this idea. And um, I think this is why this became a very unique museum in the States, actually. There's not many uh, museums in the States where you have that amount of daylight and also um, the rest of the ambient light is done with fluorescence, so there's no track lights, there's no spotlights, so it's very much against what is typically the um, custom habit, let's say, in the American museums. So, and I think that's something the artist will feel and have to and have to and can work with. So, yes, we want the building and the gallery spaces to serve the art and the artist. At the same time, we also want to give spaces with some character, you know, not just uh, an empty, empty white box. And um, but it's a fine line. How much can you want to shape the actual uh, gallery space to to not overwhelm the content that has to be shown in it? So, yeah, that's a little bit. And, and that kernel too, I think, which was very much inspired by the artist studio in the East End, is one of the ingredients that is also speaking to the visitor experience because, you know, the artists want to create their work in this atmosphere, and the visitor experience is also very much enhanced by having the daylight, having this connection back to nature and the outside, so that. The, the art experience, the museum itself, is something that everybody is welcome to come into. And it's, there's a familiarity to the space that we, maybe we take it for granted when you walk into an institution, you don't get those, some of those familiar everyday atmospheres in space, which is just about light and life and bringing that into, into the space and being able to appreciate the art in that, in that context is something that we, we really work very hard to try to cultivate here. Thank you, Philippe. I think also the approach both to Hank and to the way that you design the building is one of generosity. And so I want to, I, I think, Frank, that your show here is very generous. When, when you talk, you're so uh, clear with your message and so generous with sharing your knowledge and your art and opening the curatorial practice and showing young emerging artists. And this show, the artists that you chose, like um, Askan and Philip um, mentioned about the exhibition, 
it's very generous. These are very complicated subject matters that the artists are addressing it, and they're addressing them with metaphors that are accessible, that are generous, that elicit a civic dialogue amongst all of us. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, I feel that your approach to art and to curating and to delivering exhibitions and messages of what is happening today is, a, is one of generosity and inclusion. And then, I, and from your comments, I would like then jump to the architectural design of this building that I also think it's very generous in the sense that we can actually enjoy a lot of the building without having to go in and it's generous in terms of scale, space, air, um, vistas, and, uh, and so the combination of your show in this building is, is one where one lives, leaves the exhibition and the building up, uplifted, having learned and having experienced you know, many, many things in their, in their best kind of um, example, I think. So do you want to comment on generosity? Sure, thank you. Uh, I have to start, obviously, by thanking you all for your generosity in coming here and witnessing, welcoming us, hearing us. And I thought that it'd be nice just because I didn't greet you, but I won't be able to greet all of you. If we all just took a moment to just say hello to someone behind us, in front of us, that we have not yet actually connected with. Hello. Hi. Uh, it's so easy to forget that we're not robots. <laughs> you know, we go, we sit down, we're like, okay, so they're gonna talk, we're gonna listen. And I'm gonna say something, and I'm not even gonna think about the fact that people survived the pandemic as it meant to come here. People, you know, everyone here overcame some small and some maybe big obstacle just to come here today. And it's such an important thing to acknowledge and to remember. What I love about showing in museums is that they're some of the few places in the public where people go in to um, have their minds opening, opened. You know, most things that we do, we, you know, we go to get entertained and not to think that much, but in a museum, you're going to be challenged to be, and, and it's a place where you're invited to think differently and to grow and to learn. And I believe that great art asks questions and great design answers them, so thank you. <laughs> the quality of the questions dictates the quality of the answers. Uh, and there, this idea that I've always ch been challenged with in my own work, which is the boundary between me and you, is something that I always contend with when I am invited to do an exhibition because everything I do is in some way a collaboration with many, many people. Some people who are no longer existing physically on the planet and some people who are to come. And, and so when given this opportunity to do this exhibition and, and the way that you all framed it with the wa with, uh, Watermill Center and um, as a collaboration from the beginning, I, I really wanted to uh, highlight artists who I've known for not all I've known for a long time, but some that I've known for a long time personally who've shaped my thinking about what I could be, who I could be, what I should do. Um, and then artists whose work I, I'm, I'm aiming towards <laughs> as, 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 and getting guidance from currently. And so uh, I just really was excited to be able to, to, to make that part of my reality here. And so. Um, it's generosity, but someone said, and I'm not sure if this is relevant, but givers need takers. <laughs> yeah, it is relevant. Givers need takers, because takers don't need givers. Givers definitely do need takers. So actually, the, the gift is in the reception of someone else's form of generosity. So I'm thankful to all of the people who allow me to be generous. <laughs> and thank you all in that moment for being so generous uh, with your smiles. Thank you, Hank. And several concepts that, that Hank just brought up that I think probably resonate with some of the ideas for designing this building, right? Uh, sp general spaces, receiving and taking, collaboration. Any of those played in the concepts for designing this building? Everything of it. And it's really about the people. It's so much what Hank basically said. It's, uh, and it's, it's important that we say hello and, and know that we are not alone on this planet and that invite people in and that people can have the opportunity to participate in, in whatever way they want to participate in. And um, 
the Hamptons in Long Island is such a generous place when it comes to nature and what it has to offer in terms of light, beaches, landscape, sky, and so on. But it's also at the same time a very restricted and a very closed space also. And for us, it was important that the Parish Art Museum becomes a place that is really inviting everybody in and is very open and can always be visited also, you know. And um, that's, uh, I think you can see that. I mean, often, I, I don't know, it happened always when I go here, um, the first thing I do is that I walk around and through the building and enjoy the landscape and sit on the bench and enjoy these porches, the generous porches, protected from sun and uh, still in the landscape and very much um, perceiving what is here to offer and to, to see and to enjoy. And, and then I go inside into the galleries and have then through the windows the relation back to the landscape again and so on. So we, we felt that we really have to invite um, everybody really and uh, make this building very porous in that sense and very inviting and almost occupiable. I mean also this, this cast in concrete bench I think is such a small detail but it's so fundamental if you imagine these porches without the bench they would almost be hostile I would say yeah. but because of the bench suddenly they get this very different scale and they very clearly say use me sit on me um, or whatever uh, lie down and uh, enjoy the time and relax and also it's I think it's slowing down the visitors and I think all of that is very important in these times. Um, and, and that's why I think that design is so um, fitting to this, to this very generous place. And one last word, because you mentioned it, um, I mean, collaboration. I think this is, you very much believe in that. We very much believe in that. Um, our architecture is really born out of collaboration and dialogue and talking and understanding and listening to each other. And this is especially true also here, not only that we had a fantastic team from um, the client all the way down to the builders and all the um, planners who helped us to design this building, but we were, from the beginning, it was clear that we have to work within a very limited framework of, let's call it an economical framework also, you know, and um, and that's why we had to be extra careful in listening to the builders, for example, or to the structural engineers or to the mechanical engineers. How can we make this more efficient? How is it easier for you to do this and to build it? Um, and can we take this and make something, still something very special about it or, or uh, with it? And um, so I, I think it was one of these projects where really collaboration and being respectful to everybody who was involved in the job was absolutely key to the success of it. And the, that dialogue, I think, isn't also, how do you really create that connection with everybody here and also the people working here too? And M Monica and I were talking just before the talk about how much you love your office. And, but the fact that also the visitors and the artists and the people who work here, that they can all see each other. Uh, the, uh, and the intention of taking away the front door almost, that the porch is immediately inviting. Before you know who's in the house, you want to step onto the porch. And the moment you step onto the porch, or even before, you can already see all the way through the museum. You can see into the heart of the museum, which is the people working here, supporting and keeping the house running every day. Um, and it's back and forth. I, I can wave to <laughs> the visitors. And maybe it's a small anecdote, but sometimes you don't know where the front door actually is in this building, which might force you to make that first round around the building before you find the place to open the door. But maybe in the meanwhile, you also um, have gained some insights maybe into You've slowed down, you've stepped over this low threshold and, and had this opportunity to, I think, open your mind, as, as Hank said, and, and experience something a little different and maybe um, have a connection to people and ideas uh, that maybe we all have inside, but 
if you create the right space and atmosphere, maybe you can share that with each other more. Thank you. Yes, I do have the most beautiful office in the world, so thank you so much. Askang was telling me, how peaceful is it to look at the meadow all day long? It's not peaceful because it's nature, and it's not, it is peaceful, but sometimes we see a lot of nature, uh, you know, um, dynamics happening, which is very interesting. <laughs> but I love being able to see who's walking into the museum. I see families, I see the visitors. We do wave, you know, I wave to everyone that looks at me working in the office. And I, I think that the building is very generous in the sense that you can, at some point, the building might even disappear. We know this front lobby, you know, you can actually just not see the building and, and take your gaze all the way out through the uh, through the other side of the, of the meadow, which is, you know, not, not generally what architects do, right? Sometimes we do want our architectural buildings to, to be on a stand, and this one at some point may become invisible. And I think the building is very generous in sense of space, and uh, this diaphanous, you know, luxurious space just uh, of like being here with this much light and air, and the views to the meadows. And like what Hank was saying, you know, when you come to the parish, you know you saw an artwork at the parish. You're not like, where did I see that piece? Did I see it in this? No, you always know you're in the parish because you, you've seen the, the roof, which is, I want to talk a little bit about that. Your gaze probably went to the meadow and you're reminded of the light and the landscape that brought the artist to the parish. So all of that, those added layers of meaning and that texture to the visitor experience actually makes this place memorable together with the art. And I think that's what makes it, you know, very generous in, in, many, in, in many ways. Yeah, it also doesn't have any back and front. And um, it, that's also nice, no? I mean, nothing is hidden here. There's not, I mean, often loading docks, for example, are unsightly areas in museums hidden away somewhere. And also admin areas happen to be kind of completely stuffed away. Nothing of that here. It's all the same of the part organism. The loading dock is as important as the theater or the offices or the galleries. And I think that's also somehow generous that we treat all of these areas are needed to run a museum properly. And um, they're just there. And um, they, they, they all treat it equally. Thank you, yes. I wanted to talk a little bit about the roof and your appreciation for, well, that, that, that typology, the type of building that you chose and your appreciation for the vernacular. Um, and I think also in your work, Hank, if I may um, speculate a little bit, I think you also do appreciate a lot of, of vernacular forms and shapes and you actually revisit them because it's important for us to, to, to understand our history and where we're coming from and value. Um, can you talk a little bit about your appreciation for the vernacular, if indeed that's something you, you feel applies to your body of work? And then I'd like to talk about how you also pick up on that same concept. I want to hear what you say about the roof first. Just okay. So <laughs> What's so special about the roof? <laughs> that's exactly the point. Uh, it's just a gabled roof. No, I mean, the, the, um, uh, the house is the simplest form of um, providing protection and creating space. If you ask a kid to draw a building of a house, uh, to draw a house, it's always with a gabled roof. So, um, and, and that's why we use this typology actually in quite a few of our projects. Um, it's not specifically for this area, but in this area where everything has gabled roofs, even the potato barns, um, it probably also made even more sense um, to, to use this very simple um, typology. But um, it, has, it has two things. First of all, it really clearly says, um, come under my roof and, and be with me, but it also has a very functional um, uh, yeah, purpose by bringing in the northern light. You know? So by, by angling the roof and by having the roof angled, it's much easier to bring light in and um, keep rain and snow and all that out. And uh, it's just a very simple kind of thing. And the nice thing also about having a, a gable roof and, a, and an eave and all that, and actually we don't have a rain gutter here, you know, you might have noticed that, um, is that it's, it very directly reacts and works within nature. So when you have rain, there's a, like a curtain of water coming down, you know, and it's not something you, you hide away, it, and, and, and we like that. The roof really um, is creating these very special moments here. And 
Um, yeah. So is that what you wanted well, to hear one more about the roof? Does. Or maybe the Phil material. has a better story about the roof. <laughs> well, there's a very simple thing it does too, is that it creates this generous space that you also mentioned, Monica, and, and it's vessels of these large, generous galleries. But when you first approach the museum, which is 600 feet long, you just have this, the scale of it is very humane. So you're really only at 10 feet tall at the edge of this 36 foot tall roof. At the point that you enter the building, you, you just have a little 10 foot ceiling. It's the porch becomes a very domestic scale and very inviting, I think. It is, it's familiar. It should, it should not feel uh, overpowering. Uh, it shouldn't scare you away from the building. And then we just orient it to the north, as Oscon mentioned. And because Montauk happens to be at this arbitrary angle, it also makes the building, as long as it is, it's also surprising. It has this very dynamic relationship to, to the road that we all have to ride to get out here. <laughs> so it's... And I also, I mean, the vernacular also, and maybe the, the aspect of reuse, right? Not only like appreciating what's in, in the vernacular vocabulary here, but also the reuse of the wood and the repurposing of the wood, which I think, Hank, you also do some of that in your work. Can you tell me a little bit about that, that idea of reuse and repurposing something that's already there? Oscan mentioned that, you know, this generosity of, I think, the dialogue with the builders. And it, what was very unique in this project is we were actually working with subcontractors of the builder during the concept phase of the, of the project. And so we had this opportunity to really ask them, how would you build the building? What are the materials you use? What are the materials that make sense out here in this community? Um, and uh, like the reclaimed wood in the interior actually is was 300 years old when it was harvested 140 years ago, uh, no more like 100 years ago. So it's, and the wood is also something I think that um, it has a very tactile sensibility to it. And so as the visitor experience, you sit on it, you touch it, um, everything in the building maybe that you touch is made out of this material that has had multiple lives. And despite being, wood is once living and as a dead material, it, it actually actually has a very long life, um, and it it has a warmth to it. It's the first time you touch the building, you're grabbing that 400-year-old piece of uh, living, formerly living material, and then as you venture through the museum, you can rediscover it. I think in sort of very ergonomic ways that I think are very familiar, but hopefully. Um, make it a comfortable experience. So. so it's reclaimed wood from Virginia, from a, from a barn or a farm in Virginia? Did it's I read that correctly? from a former textile mill, actually. So it was the structural beams of the, of the roof of that facility were harvested by the mill worker and um, you know, shaped into the materials that you, you sit on now in the building. Hank, does any of this resonate with? Oh, Philip, wait, did you have anything? No. no. Look, you had one more thing? No, no, that, that's it. It's your turn. <laughs> okay, one more reclaim. So, more since you touched it, Hank, <laughs> this black material behind us, um, that also came, that was a discovery by, by the painter, who, um, we didn't reclaim the material, but he reclaimed some old knowledge, actually, of the, the old timers, when they wanted to blacken wood, they would basically soak cut nails in, in a jar of vinegar and the next day the nails would disappear and you would have a black um, dye that you could then uh, sort of finish the material with. So this, this is the lowest grade of cedar that you can buy. Um, we did have to make it economically viable and the painter found a way to sort of industri industrially uh, apply uh, this traditional kind of dyeing technique. I didn't know that. The first step actually was to spray all the wood with tea, with Lipton tea. He made a giant batch of tea, sprayed the wood, and then uh, did his vinegar nail treatment. Sounds like a kitchen. <laughs> good Sounds like a good wall label. Um, yeah, for, I, I was thinking a lot about the production of space and Henri Lefebvre. The, have you ever read that book? It's a great kind of introduction to rethinking about space. 
and that we take space for granted. We take for granted that someone said, right here, there shall be. <laughs> and then where you enter, what you enter, comes from so much experience. And the vision of people will, will enter this way and they will experience this and they'll understand the scale. I, I think a lot about uh, what used to be called wizards and sorcerers and witches. And I think that a lot of people in the creative field are, might have been uh, burned at stake <laughs> not, too, not too long ago in this very area. Because it, I think we are societies, we are the, the, the psychics and the sorcerers and the alchemists of the time where we are bringing together so many disparate things with the wisdom and knowledge of so many other people that, you're, that we're channeling their ancestors and their subconscious to bring, yeah, just, and how, the fact that I just subconsciously did this and it triggered uh, almost repressed <laughs> um, expression from you that was really profound is, is what I, where, where I kind of, hey, Paul, <laughs> DJ Spooky, um, where I get, become so, um, on his phone, <laughs> Hi. It's nice to see you. Thank you for coming. Um, but uh, I'm always on my phone, so it's not him. <laughs> but I was just like, hey, I know that person. Um, but yeah, there's something really just awesome uh, about, and, and the subliminal kid, there's something awesome about um, just being alive. You know, and so even when you said wood has as a dead material has a long afterlife or something, long life, yeah. which I was like, well, life sounds a lot better actually. But or is, yeah, because is because is it is it dead? If if we are never died, allowed to live within it, you know, or the, the the idea that we are not connected to the things that we literally inhabit is is something that it's I, I believe it's a contemporary Western concept that we've kind of embraced that we are actually at the beginning of moving away from, where we start to recognize that we are connected to everything, and, and the more that we can, can take out, like I didn't know I was touching a door that, you know, some of my ancestors might have actually even made, as indentured people and slaves in this it's country. Ve it's very likely. And so like, that's a whole other trip, to think I'm touching this door, and we do this all the time. We, I'm sure many of us have touched things that people in our DNA have made. They made so that we could exist. And so when I think about even the American flag, which is featured a lot in this exhibition, uh, and some of the other work, I, I'm really thinking a lot about the fabric of our country, the fabric of our, our world, the fabric of our lives, um, which is what brought so many of my ancestors here. Um, and, the, and, 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 and just pondering how I can just make some magic. <laughs> and, and, and the best way to do that is kind of amongst others. And so thank you all. Thank you, thank you Hank. We have like about five minutes. So I did want to open up the, the space for any comments or any questions. Um, thank you. We know we have also some of the folks that help um, make some of those partners that we had 12 years ago that are stakeholders that, that made this a reality. We have some of them in the room as well. So we would like to hear from them. But there's a question over here. Yeah, that's the, um, the biggest comment we currently get, of course, in all of our projects in umweltfreundlich sustainability. Um, is an important aspect, especially when it also comes to reuse. And we more and more actually work also, I mean, actually we always liked um, reusing even buildings, if not only material. And um, Park Avenue Armory is a good example, or even the Tate Modern and um, many other uh, examples. So um, we constantly have to do the best for that specific location, also when it comes to sustainability. And you could say now that, for example, the concrete is maybe not the most sustainable material in this case, 
But if you look at the full picture, it's actually not so bad because it's a very um, solid and massive material. So it uh, keeps the sun out, it, um, it uh, keeps the warmth in, and uh, it's, it has a lot of thermal mass. So if you would, for example, build that in a much lighter material, like all wood and so on, you have a problem with the thermal performance of the envelope. So there's always pros and cons, and you always have to look at um, the thing from all sides. You know, and um, we kept this, um, actually also it has to do with the roof. The roof is also doing a great job in, to, you know, keeping the sun out and keeping, um, for example, this glass wall here always protected. There's never really direct sun on that, which would otherwise be a huge problem, energetic-wise. You know, so that also cuts down the energy use. Um, using displacement ventilation, also meaning that we have very low air velocity in the spaces coming from the floor and sucked out in the top. It's also going with the natural um, flow of, of air and, um, and thermal performance. So also that is a very um, important measure. We have geothermal here. The entire building is, uh, has, ge uh, also has heat, heat pumps, basically. Um, so it's actually a quite... Um, sustainable building um, for what it is. So is that, was that a little bit the question or? Yeah, the geothermal here, um, and it's something about this place also that made it possible. This is the most efficient, the conditions here actually provided for the most efficient geothermal system it's completely open loop because the groundwater is so pure in Long Island mm. that you don't even have to filter it. You can bring it right through um, the heat exchange system here. And you know the same sand on the beautiful beach when we were digging the foundation, it was like the most perfect playground sand <laughs> under the building. So the, the geothermal Oscon, that was a surprise to us just how mm. incredibly efficient it was. Because um, there was a lot of talk about photovoltaics, but it's actually the geothermal system here that really makes the plant run so efficiently. Thank you, Phil. We have a couple of, oh, we have a lot of questions. Uh, um, let me go first with this gentleman, then we'll go with Alexandra, and there's a couple back there. Yes. So I was talking with the tourismo director here, Chris Sultan, and she uh, started explaining about the geothermal system here, and she Yeah, that was what a, was the reason to not use solar panels? It was economic. It was, um, at the time, uh, PV has also, I think it has also kind of moved forward, I think, in terms of its efficiency and the, the amount of, you know, the amount of energy that goes into producing it. At the time, we were weighing PV versus geothermal, and the geothermal system was just much more efficient at the time in terms of, it didn't really, the energy that's in the ground, in the groundwater, we could harvest very directly at lower cost than the PV at the time. But it's very possible to retrofit PV, especially on, the, on a project like this. It's With this on today. Uh, we have a comment there from our, the co-chair of our board of trustees, Alexandra Stanton. Heard it here first. Yeah, actually, we always thought that that would be a very easy project to um, work on the extension on because we just would make it a few hundred meters longer. Um, that would be one option. You just have to buy that piece of land there. Um, the other option is that we just do a similar kind of extrusion in the back landscape, which is also something we have looked into already. I mean, you kind of did it in a vinyl version right now. <laughs> One can do that nicer. Um, <laughs> and uh, that could then maybe also have photovoltaics um, and become like the powerhouse for the entire building. So I think extending this project could become an interesting thing and you never do the exact same again. 
doesn't make sense. Uh, time has really evolved. Only it's only 10 years, but a lot of things have changed. And I think we would really relook at it again. What would it be? But the language, I think, the idea of the house and the extrusion, still makes sense in this context. One more question over there. Um, surprises? <laughs> when you worked in the building, anything? No? How, I, how dope it was. Um, as a curator here, um, I think you guys never anticipated the pandemic. And so when we had to close in March of 2020, um, you know, we thought this is off, um, you know, off limits. We can't have the building anymore. But then we realized the building is also a canvas. And, you know, I, was, I had to postpone a show with Tomashi Jackson, but she's also a video artist. So we were able to project her videos on the facade and people driving by at night could see it. We were able to have uh, Martin Creed's, everything's gonna be all right on the facade. And then we were one of the first um, places that could uh, open again and have people outside. You know, we, we did concerts, we had gatherings long before other institutions out here could do that. So I think that was my surprise to see how incredibly versatile and, and creative this building is. No, thank you, Corinne. I mean, I think that is a actually a really good point because we were not necessarily thinking about that, that the facade would become such an important canvas display space for the museum. And um, the roughness of the concrete uh, helps, I think, that people did not feel bad drilling holes into it. And, um, and they should do it. And uh, I think it's a wonderful way to activate the building. Um, and you see it day and night from the street, and it's, uh, it's great. I mean, th that really was a very positive surprise. Indeed, and, and I think a surprise for me was when we uh, first ha started having a conversation. I was like, how precious do you think we have to be with these facades, with the meadow, we know with the building, and you're like, and, and your response was no, we're, you know, the building is here to kind of like serve you and for it to be unpacked during the years. And so thank you for giving us this perfect building with the, the perfect kind of like gateway to the Hamptons and uh, so thoughtful and so cared for. And Hank, likewise to you, thank you for being here as well. Uh, thank you everyone. We will be having a reception here. So for those of you who were not able to ask your questions right now, you can ask them near the bar. Maybe sometimes that's a better setting. But in any case, thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you to the funders. And, th and thank, you to, thank you to everyone that helped us make this a reality and to everyone that was here 12 years ago. Thank you. <laughs>